Good evening. This presentation will describe how we can assess palliative care needs and barriers in humanitarian settings. My name is Dr. Megan Doherty and I'm a palliative care physician in Ottawa, Canada and on the executive of PalChase. My objectives for today are to help you understand the specific palliative care needs in humanitarian contexts and to describe how to conduct a palliative care needs assessment in a humanitarian setting, describing key lessons learned from our previous experiences doing this. I'm going to use the example of the Rohingya refugee crisis in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, to illustrate these points. This refugee crisis began in 2017 when almost 900,000 refugees arrived from Myanmar. They were fleeing violence and they arrived in a remote area on the border in Bangladesh. And more than 60% of these refugees were children. So at this time, at the end of 2017, we had a big challenge in this community is that we didn't know about the individuals with serious illnesses and what were their palliative care needs. So we decided to conduct a rapid situational analysis of the Rohingya refugee situation. And our goal was to describe the needs of children and adults living with serious or life-threatening illnesses. We wanted to understand the specific challenges they faced in accessing medical care and their basic needs, and understand how the available health resources, including pharmaceutical and health facilities, were able to support them or not. I'm gonna just discuss some key points and lessons that we learned from our experience. The first was the importance of really going and listening to the patients and caregivers themselves. So in our needs assessment, we conducted interviews. We went house to house, identifying individuals with palliative care needs and their caregivers and interviewing them about their needs. We used convenient sampling methodology and the sample size was determined by the maximum number of eligible participants that could be consented and interviewed during the data collection period. These are some key techniques that you can use or consider using if you were to do a similar needs assessment in another humanitarian crisis. There were additional components to our study and I will discuss them in the coming slides. And this figure just shows one of our interviewers, a young Rohingya man interviewing a patient in their own home about their palliative care needs. Another key lesson that we identified was how important the interviewers were. We had to train and support our interviewers. They were young people from the Rohingya camps themselves. They spoke Rohingya and they had grown up living in the refugee camp. The vast majority of them had actually come to Bangladesh as children or had been born in the refugee camps because there had been previous waves of migration of Rohingya from Myanmar into Bangladesh. So they had not just arrived, they had arrived many years before or actually had lived their whole life in the camps. But the advantage was they knew the camp situation well and they spoke the same language as those who had newly arrived. You can see on the right hand side an image of Dr. Farzana Khan, my colleague and palliative care physician in Bangladesh, who is training these interviewers. We provided two days training and this included a substantial portion of role playing with them practicing conducting the interviews because they had to ask questions about what type of serious illness the individual had and their pain and other symptoms which would be challenging for people without any background in healthcare to ask. So we spent a lot of time reviewing the exact wording that they would use in Rohingya to ask these questions and the responses that they might receive and how they would write those down. We also provided field supervision of the surveyors. So we went with them and sat in on the interviews in the patient's homes, listening and supporting them to conduct the interviews. And we did this in partnership with an organization called OBAT Helpers. And I want to highlight this partnership because it was key. This is an, an NGO in Bangladesh which has existing activities in Bangladesh in the field of health. And we were able to partner with them to use their facilities, including this house that I show you in the top right hand corner, where we could train our surveyors and we could have sort of a base from which our surveyors went out every day to do the interviews. And also they actually helped us find the individuals who interviewed for us. They were workers who had been working with OBAT helpers previously. 
And this is particularly important in a humanitarian crisis situation when often the crisis can arise suddenly and a whole bunch of aid organizations will flood into the area where the refugees are. And this can be in the, mean there are very few resources available. We weren't able to find you know, another facility to rent to do the training. It was very hard to find and rent vehicles because they were all, all the local rental vehicles had been used up and rented up by other humanitarian aid organizations. Another key consideration when you're considering doing a needs assessment is who to interview. You know you want to identify palliative care, individuals needing palliative care, but how do you identify them? They don't just walk around saying, I need palliative care. So you want to be train your um, interviewers to be able to identify individuals with serious illness. Again, this requires training and discussion and providing them with examples. We also provided them with the option to check in by phone with one of the study coordinators who was a physician to make sure that, they, um, that the patient was appropriate for an interview. We wanted to include children, and I emphasize this point because many times when this kind of work is done, the thought is, oh, children are more vulnerable, it's difficult to uh, assess them or identify them, so they get um, overlooked. But we felt it was very important to include children, and we just interviewed a parent or primary caregiver adult. And then the other question to ask um, is, what about the host population? So 900,000 Rohingya refugees had moved into an area with a local host population of several hundred thousand. And that host population also likely had significant palliative care needs because there weren't actually existing palliative care services in that region. So you may want to consider how you would assess the palliative care needs for the host population at the same time so that you don't create disparities in the health systems between what's available for the refugees and what's available for the locals. We also found it very important to spend some time properly developing an interview guide or your survey tools or questionnaires. And we did this all very rapidly, even though there were a number of steps. We conducted this all within two weeks time frame. We started with a literature review where we looked at the SPHERE guidelines, which are standards for healthcare delivery in humanitarian settings and they had included palliative care for the first time. So we took that plus additional literature, including specifically we looked at previous palliative care needs assessments that had been done in low and middle income settings. And a needs assessment had been done nationally in Bangladesh the year before we did this needs assessment. So that was very helpful. All of this was put together into a draft interview guide, which then we received input and feedback from a global group of content experts, including palliative care physicians, nurses, experts in non-communicable diseases, and experts in humanitarian health care. This led to the development of a pilot interview guide, which we tested with 10 Rohingya interviewers, and then we had them pilot test it with 20 Rohingya patients and caregivers. And there were substantial modifications in this phase to improve the clarity of the questions and the response options based on what would be appropriate for the Rohingya culture and the refugees' experiences. And finally, this led to two final interview guides, one for patients and one for caregivers. The type of data that we ended up collecting from these interviews included the type of serious medical condition and treatment that the patient was receiving and could they access those treatments. The presence of pain and other symptoms, including treatments for symptoms and pain and their efficacy. The individual's need for medicines and other medical supplies their basic needs such as food and shelter and were these adequately met, their healthcare seeking behaviors, had they recently had any healthcare experiences and what were the barriers they experienced at facing to accessing healthcare and treatment. And for caregivers, we focus primarily on their caregiving responsibilities, training that they had or needed to be able to care for the individual who was seriously ill and their support needs. I'll highlight a few key findings from our needs assessment. One was about pain and pain relief. We didn't find any patients who received opioids. There were no retail pharmacies that stocked opioids that we could identify. And there was only one health facility in the whole region that had opioids in stock. Many patients with pain received paracetamol or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but they reported that most of this the time, these medicines did not give them any pain relief. When we looked at patients accessing healthcare itself, they frequently visited health facilities. In fact, most had visited a health facility in the past few weeks. But they said that 60% of the time, these encounters didn't actually address their concerns and didn't fix their problem. 
and they reported some common barriers to accessing health care, including money, the fact that treatment for their specific condition was not actually available from health centers, and the need for transportation. And transportation was particularly important because the camps are in a very rural area and were built on very rugged terrain, very hilly and very difficult to navigate on foot if you aren't able-bodied. We also looked at patients' basic and essential needs, and they, when we asked the question, what is your greatest need, they said medication. In fact, 97% of them said that, and most had stopped taking medications because of the cost. Money was their second greatest need. Food, pain relief, and someone to care for them were also very substantial needs. Caregivers' needs included the fact that it was very physically demanding to care for the sick individual. They didn't have any help. Caring for the individual caused them sadness or anxiety, and they reported a lack of time and money. There were two additional components to our needs assessment, which I won't go over in detail, but I want to highlight that it's important to conduct these parts as well. First off, we looked at health facilities. So we went to all the key health facilities in the region, and we looked at their opioid availability and what was their provisions for care for patients with serious illnesses. You can see several images on the left of the Red Cross Field Hospital, which was actually relatively well equipped and did have opioids available. It included even a playroom, as you can see in the top right. But this hospital would stay in place for only the first six months of the crisis. And five years on, the patients are and Rohingya refugees are still in Bangladesh. The second other part of our needs assessment was a pharmacy survey. So we surveyed all the retail pharmacies in the region that we could identify. And, for, and in fact, there were very few because, like I said, it was a very, very rural area. And actually, a lot of it was jungle before the refugee camps. Um, were set up there. But at the local pharmacies, we were looking for which medicines they had available from the WHO Essential Medicine Package for Palliative Care. And you can see an image of one of the pharmacists that we interviewed in the middle of this slide. And then on the right hand side, you can see an image of myself and Dr. Farsana meeting with the team from Handicap International, so another health provider in the Rohingya camps. And so we, we made sure to visit not only health facilities, but also health providers who were caring for some individuals who may have palliative care needs. And so it was actually very useful for us to meet with these organizations because later on, as we started to develop a palliative care program in the Rohingya camps, we were able to collaborate and leverage the services that other organizations provided. The last component of a needs assessment is knowledge dissemination. And the, some key learnings that we had from this stage was that you need to have the access to the right people. So we had to make contacts within the World Health Organization and the International Organization for Migration. And once we had preliminary data, it was very helpful that we were able to share that very quickly with them. We were able to meet with them. We went to the NCD group meetings and we were able to highlight these significant gaps in the provision of palliative care and care for individuals with serious illnesses. We chose to focus on writing and disseminating an advocacy report first, which was called Neglected Suffering, the Unmet Need for Palliative Care in Cox's Bazaar. And this came out in March 2018, so very uh, within three months of our needs assessment. And as you can see, our academic article, which is shown on the right, uh, took two more years to get published. So that's why we really focused on the advocacy report first, because we knew we could get that out quickly um, and that this would make a difference. It was in a um, less scientific or academic language and was very readily accessible and we use this to promote palliative care and really speak about the need for palliative care. And lastly, I won't spend much time focusing on it, but I would say that all of this needs assessment led directly to implementation. So everything we learned from our needs assessment itself, we then took and put into our plan to implement palliative care and almost Immediately after conducting the needs assessment, we were able to start implementing palliative care because we understood the needs of the patients and the families well, and we knew from our health facilities and pharmacy surveys that there wasn't palliative care available and there wasn't palliative care medications available for patients. So we used our existing knowledge of the palliative care system and opioid availability in Bangladesh to bring some of that to the Rohingya camps. 
And I think this is specifically how it's very important for people who are involved in a country's palliative care system to get involved in the refugee and the humanitarian crisis situation in that country, because you as palliative care providers will know how to access opioids in your country. As an example, in the Rohingya camps, all of the foreign NGOs and large organizations that came in were not familiar with the opioid procurement system in Bangladesh. But having Dr. Farzana Khan on our team, a palliative care expert from Bangladesh, who had been specifically working on ensuring opioid access and getting morphine uh, produced locally in Bangladesh, having her on our team allowed us to quickly access morphine from the capital city of Dhaka because we knew how to do that. We knew the regulations and we knew that it was available locally. It didn't have to be shipped in from abroad, which always causes a lot of barriers at um, international borders. Other things that really we used from our debt, uh, needs assessment to leverage our implementation is you may recognize these two individuals sitting here. They're now community health workers who provide palliative care in the Rohingya camps, but they started out as interviewers in our needs assessment. So it's a good way to access individuals who might then consider working with you in the future. And this lady was an individual who actually participated in our initial needs assessment survey. And then we already had patients. We knew a little bit about how to find them again and they were able to, to come in. We invited them to join into our palliative care program, some of them who were in the, in the region where we started the program. And there's some excellent links here, which include a video which shows a much bigger palliative care program that got started in early 2020 with the IOM, which was based on our initial work. So I encourage you to look at the link to the YouTube video and also the storyteller file here, which tell you more about it. So in summary, the lessons learned from this needs assessment were that local interviewers are key. They can help you with language and culture adaptations um, of your guide and also just conducting your interviews. And they have comfort and familiarity with the local situation that you may not have, even if you're from the country where the crisis is occurring. It's good to broadly consider how you're going to assess needs, develop good assessment tools and refine and pilot those tools. Talk to patients and caregivers, but also think about looking at health facilities and opioid availability because these are really key steps that will guide you in implementation. And then think about how you're going to disseminate knowledge effectively about what you've learned and how you'll then implement. Thank you very much.